Hello and welcome to Roundtable. France says it has three priorities as it takes over the EU presidency for the next six months. Holding social media to account, hitting imports to the EU with carbon taxes and cross-European laws on minimum wages. That may be what it wants, but it is a country being criticised for what some perceive as its anti-Muslim laws. And with presidential elections just months away, will France be able to set its own agenda? Very good to have your company. I'm David Foster. France has taken over the presidency of the European Union, but its ambitious plans for a sovereign Europe could be undone by the pandemic and elections in April. While there's been a pushback in Eastern European capitals, the French president Emmanuel Macron does have the powerful backing of his country's powerful neighbour Germany. The new German foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, said when she met her French opposite number that the two countries, quote, as the closest of friends at the heart of Europe, bear a special responsibility for a united European Union capable of acting and looking towards the future. France's president, she added, is an important opportunity we want to seize together to strengthen Europe and make it fit to rise up to tomorrow's challenges. Well, France's President Macron says he wants to increase the EU's power in the world and its sovereignty, which may be at odds with some of the 27 members who view sovereignty in their own countries as paramount. Our joint responsibility in Europe is also to continue the work and relationship between the European Union and China, particularly the targeted action against Lithuania, which continued to worry us. And so, on this aspect, our approach is that of unity and solidarity, but also the desire to move forward on subjects on which the Sino-European discussion is pivotal. The climate is part of this, and the question of the African continent requires it. And you will be able to see in Brussels, Shada Islam joining us. Uh, she's based there. She's a specialist on EU affairs. Been on the programme before. Welcome back. And from London, we once again say hello to Philippe Malière, Professor of French and European Politics, at University College London. We head to Paris and there we meet The Telegraph, The Daily Telegraph, London columnist, who is a French journalist, and Elisabeth Moutet. Thank you very much indeed. All three of you have been on before. We welcome you back, and Elisabeth. Last time I spoke to you, uh, you were in London. Now you're back in the French capital. Do you think Macron has something to prove with the first round of the presidential election coming up in April and only six months in the EU presidency? What's his plan? Yes, he has something to prove. He wants to show that France is the uh, political leader of Europe. And one of the reasons why he wants to prove that is that there's a kind of, uh, not exactly a vacuum, but certainly a weak uh, place for Germany, as Germany has just changed chancellors. And the new chancellor, the um, uh, coalition leader, uh, social democrat, uh, uh, Olaf Scholz is not yet well established, uh, and uh, the first moves in, in foreign uh, policy by Germany were uh, uh, discussed, especially since Germany absolutely refuses to bring any kind of help to Ukraine as Ukraine is being threatened by Moscow. So uh, uh, Macron sees a political vacuum, and he's very interested in having France fill it. The other thing is that, of course, if France fills this vacuum in any way, apparently, um, it will help him in his electoral uh, uh, campaign. He's running for president again on the 7th and 21st of April. As you know, we have a system in which we have a first round with lots of candidates and a runoff two weeks later uh, when the, the, the ones who came first uh, and second uh, battle it out. Macron has been leading in every poll for the, for the runoff, around 25% voting intentions. But in the second round, there's at least one candidate who has beaten him beaten in a poll. She is the centre-right Valérie Pécresse, uh, the Républicain candidate. And therefore, uh, his interest is that somebody else, probably Marine Le Pen, will be in the second round and not Madame Pécresse. And all of this uh, sort of is, is brought together uh, with 
to, to make him want uh, um, uh, France uh, to make a very good impression in foreign policy. Macron has got criticism in domestic policies, but he feels that uh, uh, looking decisive and, and authoritative on Europe will help him. Let's throw up a few words from Valérie Pécresse uh, from Les Républicains onto the screen. Uh, it's a mistake that's taking on the presidency. He's doing it for his own interests, not those of France. Uh, Philippe, is, is that a, a general assumption that he's grandiose? He's trying to put himself center stage in terms of Europe, not necessarily for France or for Europe, but for Macron moi-même. That's what his opponents are saying at the moment, which is, of course, he's, he'll be using the EU presidency in order to score political points in the roll-up to this uh, presidential election, where, he, of course, he hopes to run and be uh, re-elected. So uh, traditionally, you know, European affairs, international affairs do not play a major role in uh, internal politics, particularly when in uh, we are uh, sort of uh, about, the French are about to vote for uh, their president. However, of course, if he can sort of make uh, sort of interesting noises and show that he's leading Europe on a number of issues, of course, that will probably uh, play very well with, with the electorate. But again, I think uh, to get back to your initial question, I think what does he have to prove? I think he has to prove that he can be uh, re-elected, of course, and that he is as popular as he was uh, when he was elected uh, five years ago. Five years ago, he was a young, he, he was elected with the image of a young liberal modernizer. And I think that's probably the problem for Macron today. He is not regarded by uh, large uh, segments or chunks of the electorate in France as this uh, once uh, um, uh, liberal modernizer. I think that's that's his problem. I think the sort of uh, breath of fresh air that Macron represented five years ago is probably gone. I think he came uh, while being, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a government, in socialist government, center-left, uh, ran for the presidency, won without uh, the support of a political party that was really a, a big, uh, a big shock, a big, a big surprise. And then he was seen, yes, possibly as a kind, if you like, of a possible Justin Trudeau of French politics. And I think uh, he, that things haven't worked out this way. I think now he's been pushed to the right uh, and notably on a number of issues regarding, you know, public freedom, uh, the management of, of um, migration, uh, the, 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 the management of uh, uh, minorities in France, uh, I think is regarded by his critiques as very much having gone a long way to, to, to the right and, and sort of playing for a kind of a, a right wing or if not far right gallery. So I think that's the problem we, we, with Macron. Sort of He's lost me, a lot of support in the center. If I may stop you there, Philippe, which leads me to, to you, Shad, that over the course of the last five years, we've seen what many perceive to be anti-Islam legislation, what they would call um, extreme Islam laws and the separatism bill. Um, have you noticed a change? Because we're going to get on to policies in just a moment, but I'm talking about personalities here. H have you noticed the change in the man who Philippe described as perhaps be being a liberal five years ago? Yes, I have. I've noticed a change. I have to say that there's much in uh, Macron's uh, policies that I do admire. Uh, on the European scene, he is undoubtedly stands out for his uh, vision, his imagination, his creativity. He's talking about a strategic autonomy for Europe. He's talking about reinvigorating relations with Africa. And he's talking about giving the European Union more clout on the global stage. He doesn't want to fall into this binary trap between the US and China. So really on foreign policy, many aspects of foreign policy, I think he is quite an inspiring figure. And that's why I think feel very let down that on issues to do with minorities, especially with Muslims, not just in France, but, you know, the impact of French policies, because France is such an important locomotive in the European Union, the impact of French policies on Muslims, minorities, migration, refugees, has uh, has contagion, has, infects the rest of Europe. And there, as Philippe has very rightly said, he's been drifting 
slowly, but I would say steadily towards the, the far right. And I know it's because of electoral reasons, but frankly, I'm very disappointed because I think leaders should lead and not follow. And I think, you know, if electorate in France is going to vote far right, they're going to go for the real deal and not Emmanuel Macron, who at his heart, I think, still remains uh, quite liberal. But, you know, it's electoral politics, it's toxic and Islamophobia, as many have said, has become an electoral campaign strategy in France. It's very, very disappointing. And I have to say, I'm frankly quite heartbroken over it. So, Anne Elizabeth, let me ask you about um, this image now of a, of a tougher, um, more uh, cynical, if, if you like, politician who is taking on the presidency of the European Council. Do you think some of that um, abrasiveness, perhaps when it comes to um, the Muslim population in Europe will come across to the more populist governments in Poland, in, in Hungary and other places, it, mostly in, in the Far East, uh, will come across as sort of some kind of encouragement. First of all, I don't think they need encouragement. And um, I don't think uh, a country that has also sort of had uh, a much tougher attitude on such questions, like Britain is taking any kind of inspiration from France at all. Uh, but I also think that these are domestic policies in France and that there is the very specific quality of secularism, laïcité, which is part and parcel of the French Republic, which is not something that Macron would want to apply to any other country in Europe. So that's not something that he leads on. It is not at all in the very uh, broad platform that he's prepared. It's going to be a very busy uh, European Council presidency. Uh, it's going so, to. So, so that side of him, you think, is purely for the domestic audience, uh, and you're leading uh, into what he might want to do in, in Europe. Finish what you were saying. I'm sorry, I wanted to draw a line perhaps <laughs> under a, a one section of the program. And then I'm going to ask you about this idea of sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty is. Uh, Macron believes that. Uh, Europe should ex exercise more sovereignty uh, in it's commonly and at the same time, because, you know, it was his campaign slogan, en même temps, at the same time. So he both says Europe has got to have strategic uh, importance, initiative, uh, uh, defend herself, have a strategic defense, um, exist in the diplomatic world, uh, exist as a bloc. And at the same time, whenever he feels that there's an opening for France in itself, in herself, to, to push her own sovereignty, uh, he's also for that. Uh, uh, some of it is cynical because uh, he believes that whenever there's an opportunity, he should grab it. But some of it is actually the way the French have actually been seeing and using, if you will, Europe ever since the, the founding of it by uh, Adenauer, uh, Jean Monnet, Robert Schumann and Alcide de Gasperi. Um, it's, it's the French attitude is uh, um, we have our characteristics and we keep them. And at the same time, we want to push Europe. Uh, but there are many things he wants in many in many areas, many, many um, um, domains, and they have to do with uh, taxing, you know, the uh, uh, the, the GAFA, the uh, uh, high tech American high tech giants, establishing a carbon tax at the borders of Europe. That has been shut down by Germany, who prefers to and tax the internal up on market. European border controls as well. Uh, well, yes, but that can be translated as actually applying uh, the, the Schengen rules. If you apply the Schengen rules, uh, then you, 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 you get exactly what it is. What, what he's complaining about is that they're not being applied even though they have been comforted by the Dublin Treaty uh, and that they, uh, they are essentially being flouted. That's the way it's being seen in Paris. And that's, to be honest, is the way it's being seen in most European countries nowadays is uh, as long as you confer, we still believe in uh, welcoming refugees who come from places is where their life is in danger. But there's a feeling, I think, across Europe that it is an impossibility to welcome economic migrants, mostly because uh, there are billions of them, literally, yeah. and, and Europe cannot welcome them and, and give both them and, and their own citizens a, a, a decent so, life. There has to be a, a pace to that. Um, I don't think he's going to be very active specifically on, on, on that aspect. It's not the biggest one. I think it's a very domestic issue. And he's going, but he's going to be more active on, on all the rest. Um, he's also, I mean, there are things that he wants to do. He wants to uh, have a converging system of a unique minimum wage across Europe. And that, of course, means that uh, just as the euro was started in the 90s and only reached in 2002, um, uh, right now, the idea of a minimum wage would be different 
different because the economy is different, but the idea is to bring slowly all of the Europe continent uh, to the same minimum wage so that you cannot have social dumping anymore. He's got lots of ambitions and he wants to make his mark. Well, of course, I mean, part of the problem with that is, of course, um, different economies run at different speeds. Yes. And if you impose the same minimum wage across the entire block, then some countries may find it more difficult uh, than others. Uh, Philippe, which, I want you to comment on what you've heard Which is why he wants to delay from... it. Okay. Which, I mean, he's always said that that would be some of the slow converging system. He's not saying, right, you know, the day after tomorrow, we're all going to have the same minimum wage. It's going to be the same thing as bringing the currencies within the eurozone. Okay, thank you, Anne Elizabeth. Uh, Philippe, I want to ask you uh, to comment on what you've heard so far, but I want to ask you more questions about sovereignty. And the point I want to bring in here is if he wants to see um, a more impressive, a, a more vocal um, and influential Europe. What about those countries that see their own sovereignty as as paramount? Is, is there a possibility of a clash coming up there? Yes, I think Macron has been, of course, uh, paying close attention to what is going on in the West the Balkans. The situation, uh, uh, notably um, uh, in, um, uh, in in the border with Russia, I think it's probably, of, of course, something where he will uh, certainly. Uh, make sure that the, the countries in that region, the region around Russia, who, uh, of course, wants to claim their independence, are able to do so without any any external threat. Uh, but the, the problem is with Macron is always, I think he's always very big on rhetoric and I think quite uh, pleasing and quite uh, enticing and sounding like a liberal modernizer again. Uh, but it's the delivery which probably uh, is a bit disappointing. And I think if you just look at the question, and again, that, that relates to your issue of sovereignty, the question of migration, making the right sound, I suppose, uh, in Europe, but look at the treatment of, of uh, economic and political migrants uh, to France. I think you're not far from England, across the Channel. There's this terrible situation in Calais where uh, the French police is, is dealing with those uh, poor people in the most heavy-handed manner. And of course, it's a co-responsibility of the French and the British authorities. But uh, of course, uh, not so long ago, this uh, uh, boat uh, which uh, tried to cross the channel and uh, 17 or more people uh, uh, eventually died in the waters. And I think uh, there was very little reaction on the part of, of the French authorities on that, which I think. Well, is, I, is I do shocking. believe it was it was more than 17. I think it was well yes. into the 20s. Um, and and therefore, when it comes to achievements and, and objectives outside France with this EU presidency. I'm going to put this up on the screen. This is from Sébastien Maillard uh, from the Jacques Delors Institute. Uh, he says Macron's got pressure on him to deliver after having talked up what he can do. Uh, these are his words. He can't get to the first round, that is, of the presidential election uh, without having obtained some results from the European presidency. That's the challenge for him, but it can also be a real opportunity. Shada, I will come to you in a moment, but I would like Philippe to give his thoughts on that first. Yes, I, I, as I said earlier, I think any achievements uh, by Macron uh, between now and the first round of the election would be would be very good for him. And I but what think could they was, be? Uh, I think probably... Uh, of course, we haven't talked about it yet, but there is a pandemic going on. It's been going on for now almost two years. And I think any uh, sort of uh, consultation between member states uh, and better cooperation on the front of, for instance, vaccination. Uh, and Europe, of course, has a duty to, to vaccinate its, its own population, but also to do something uh, about a population outside of the, of the EU. Because, of course, we know that part of the problem, notably with all the variants, is that if Europe and the developed world has a you know, quite high rate of people who are now vaccinated, I think that's not the case in other areas in the world, notably a poorer country. So I think something has to be done. Macron, again, has said probably the right things, you know, uh, about that. But I think we Europe now needs to deliver. So I think I would hope that the French presidency would would uh, would do uh, would go some way into uh, actually doing something for poor countries, you know, which uh, uh, can't afford to buy uh, the, the vaccines as as they as they are and, and probably uh, needs the, the support of uh, richer countries. Shada, last 
June, I think it was, the European Council on Foreign Relations did a survey. It spoke to people in Spain, Italy, Austria, uh, France, and they were questioned about what they thought of the European Union, because with the results that I'm about to, to mention, it makes me wonder whether Macron is in an impossible situation, because uh, pick out France in particular, 62% apparently said they thought that the European Union was broken, it was dysfunctional, almost two thirds. Therefore, if Macron tries to do something to improve what is considered to be already broken by the French people, could he perhaps be lessening his popularity at home? Well, the thing is, um, the, the three ways, and I follow up what uh, Philippe has said, the three things that Europe and, and France can do together. First of all, Africa, as I mentioned before, and there, of course, Philippe's point about COVAX, the International Solidarity Mechanism for Vaccines, is, for vaccines, is very important. Um, if that system, which is quite uh, broken at the moment, if there, there are real deliveries of vaccines, especially to African countries where only 10% of the population is fully vaccinated. I think that will be quite a headline story. Uh, and I think it will be good for France's image, but also very good for the European Union's image in Africa. It's fading very, very quickly. There's competition from China, Russia, Turkey, and others. There's also the question of special drawing rights for African countries. You know, these are special uh, drawing rights that the International Monetary Fund has agreed. And many, most of the, those rights have gone to developed countries. These so, sorry countries to, sorry don't to really need but it. What are people going to think who already think the European Union is a weight on their backs? What are they going to think if Macron is um, giving his energy and Europe's money to help people outside France when the people within France don't think they're getting enough as it is? Well, I think the point is, you know, and I think the other panelists uh, actually mentioned it, um, there is a great deal of concern here about migration. And the concern is obviously coming from Africa, more migrants coming from Africa. So obviously the more, I mean, this is the theory, I don't really believe it myself, but the, what the population can be convinced is if you are nicer, if you give more money, if you invest more and create jobs in Africa itself, there will be less temptation for younger people there to come to Europe to seek work. So I think France realizes that, and Africa is actually very much a domestic issue in Europe, as well as being a foreign policy issue. And my point is really, you know, that the internal and the external are very much related. And someone said that, you know, this is domestic policy, it's not European policy. Well, I have to say in the 27 EU countries, domestic policies very quickly get a very European perspective to them as well. So, and yes, the other yes, thing they, I they, really they want may to be related is to, also to the conference... They may be related to people in power and people who write about these things, whether they are related to the ordinary citizen who has an equal vote in the ballot booth is, a, is another question. We've only got a couple more minutes. So, Anne Elizabeth, I'm going to throw this one to you. Is holding the EU presidency purely ceremonial? Can he push through things he wants to change? And if he managed to do so, would he be doing it for his own aggrandissement or would he be doing it for the benefit of the European Union? Well, to answer your last question first, I would say that it doesn't really matter, does it? If he does it and he, if he achieves something, it will be a good thing and his motivations don't matter. Uh, can he do it? Uh, we are at a time, I mean, there's a series of sort of tectonic plates that have been moving within the EU. I mean, the biggest shock was Brexit. And the other one, as I said, was the, the change of, of government in Germany. And finally, it's the fact that we're suddenly being faced by something uh, just east of us, uh, which is which could degenerate into a real war, uh, which is the attack of, of Ukraine by, by Russia, which is, which is a really big thing. So um, uh, I think that right now, any kind of achievement should, will be driven by all that. There might might be more sort of uh, uh, open minds in Brussels to taking French advice uh, to some level, at least, just because there's this feeling of urgency. On the other hand, you can always uh, count sometimes uh, on, on the European institutions to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And they might just decide that Macron is too forthright, too aggressive. And, and not make it work. And sometimes, most of the time, consensus is a good thing. And there are moments when you need to push things a bit. I do not know. A I have perfect... no predictions. <laughs> a perfect time and a place uh, for a man who wants to remain in the Elysee Palace, you might say, or perhaps it is a poison chalice. But the, the challenges are there, as France assumes the presidency of the EU Council. 
uh, as we say goodbye here on Roundtable. Thank you very much indeed, Shada Islam, Philippe Marlier, and Anne Elizabeth Moutet. Great to have you all on the program again, and a, a very happy 2022 to you from us. Thank you for watching this program, wherever you happen to be. We would welcome you back with open arms anytime. From me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team, goodbye. <laughs>